So it's time to start learning about the MHC molecules. The MHC molecules are really important molecules within immunology and actually throughout the body. And they recognize a portion of immunology that has to do with antigen presentation. Generally speaking, there are two types of antigens. Those that exist inside your cells and those that exist outside of your cells. These are generally referred to as intracellular antigens and extracellular antigens. Antibodies, which are secreted by plasma cells, are capable of recognizing antigen in the absence of any influence from any other cell in the body. If they are specific for a particular surface antigen on a microbe and that microbe is present, they will be able to bind it. T cells, on the other hand, are a little bit more selective and discerning. They want their antigen served to them on a silver platter. They can't bind extracellular antigen. They can't even see it or recognize it, even if they were specific for it. So they need the MHC molecules, because in this case, the silver platter is actually a glycoprotein that can be expressed on the surface of our cells, enabling T cells to be able to see the antigens from the cells, recognize them, and mount an immune response. The major histocompatibility complex, or MHC, refers to an, a group of tightly linked genes that are encoded on chromosome 6 in humans. They are called histocompatibility because they were initially identified as molecules involved in transplant rejection, but they did not evolve evolutionarily to give transplant surgeons and immunologists headaches, although they do that quite effectively. They evolved so that T cells could recognize and react to antigens that are inside your cell. Thus, antibodies are protecting us from things outside our cells and T cells for things that have gotten in. The MHC genes are grouped into three classes, class 1, class 2, and class 3. And these classes are actually a very useful designation because within the same class, all of the molecules are going to have the same structure, function, and tissue distribution. So if you learn one, you learn them all. The proteins that they encode for are collectively called the human leukocyte antigens, or HLAs. Now, this again is a bit of a misnomer, as HLA molecules are not only found on leukocytes. In fact, they can be found on nearly every cell in the body. So let's take the MHC molecules by class, and I'm going to go a little out of order here, and I'm going to start with the MHC3 class. Now, here's the thing. We can largely ignore the MHC3 class of molecules. They are named MHC molecules because they're kind of grouped in the same genetic region as the other MHC genes in all species that we've looked at. Um, but they don't actually have anything to do with antigen presentation. They include things like complement proteins, like C2, C4, and factor B, and the TNF-alpha and TNF-beta genes. But as I mentioned, these genes have absolutely nothing to do with antigen presentation. And as far as you're concerned, MHC is all about antigen presentation. So I shall never speak of them again. Be gone, or at least not in the context of MHC. So what do you actually need to know about the MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules? Well, you need to know their names. And by that, I don't mean MHC class 1 and class 2. I mean HLA, because remember, the genes are named MHC1 and MHC2, but their names are actually human leukocyte antigens. The proteins they, they encode for are human leukocyte antigens, or HLAs, and they have distinctive names, DP, DQ, DR for MHC class 2, and A, B, and C for MHC class 1. You need to know their tissue distribution. It is very different for the two classes. You need to know their biological function. Each of them really only has one function, so it's pretty easy. And bonus, if you know their tissue distribution, you can easily figure out their function. And the entire class has the same function. So while it might look like you're learning six, you're actually only learning two. You also need to know a little bit about their structure. And remember, within classes, they're all going to have the same structure and assembly. And that tells you a lot about the functions that they will do. So let's start with MHC class 1. Remember, the names of the MHC class 1 molecules are HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. You can remember this by remembering that MHC class 1 molecules are named with one 
letter. They're not the only ones. There are some found during development or in lower concentrations called HLA E, F, and G, but they aren't the main ones. So the ones you really need to keep in mind are these three. Tissue distribution for class one is pretty easy. It's all nucleated cells, every single one of them. Even platelets, which are actually just fragments of nucleated cells, have MHC class one molecules on them. The only cells that don't express MHC at all are mature red blood cells, your erythrocytes, because they are non-nucleated. So very widely distributed and at a very fairly high concentration. Okay, structure. So the structure of the MHC class two molecule, you have two chains, an alpha chain and then kind of an invariant chain, which is known as the beta two microglobulin. So how does this work? So let's imagine that blue line is our cell membrane. This is the structure of your MHC class one molecule. So just to orient you, here are the two chains. This is your alpha chain, and this is your beta two microglobulin chain. And this right here is the peptide binding groove, where basically any peptides it presents are going to sit very nicely there. The alpha chain is made up of three subunits, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. And they form these kind of globular sites, right? And you can see that the alpha-1 and the alpha-2 domains are what actually contribute to the peptide binding. So what's the deal with this guy, this beta-2 microglobulin? Well, the beta-2 microglobulin, as it turns out, is actually pretty important. The beta-2 microglobulin basically is the stability structure for this whole molecule. If you don't have beta-2 microglobulin, then you express no MHC. The MHC class one molecule needs it in order to be expressed on the surface. So it kind of props up the molecule just, and that makes it stand up straight. And without beta-2 microglobulin, the whole thing goes away and crumbles like a house of cards. Um, deficits in this will result in no MHC class one expression on the cell. So it's important to note that MHC molecules are not antigen recognition receptors. They bind peptides, and they don't really care what kind of peptides they bind. They do not distinguish between self and not self. They bind self peptides just as good as non-self peptides. They are also not all that specific, and they can bind a wide variety of molecules as long as it's the right size. That is key. MHC class 1 molecules bind peptides that are about 8 to 10 amino acids long. And this is because they actually have kind of a closed cleft. Um, some people kind of, if you look at this from above, it looks kind of like a hot dog in a hot dog bun. Now, on a protein, you need to be able to find 8 to 10 amino acids that are fairly hydrophobic in nature. And that's because this peptide binding cleft is pretty hydrophilic. So in order to get like a good association between the peptide and the binding groove, you need to have it be hydrophobic. So where are you going to find 8 to 10 hydrophobic amino acids in a row? Well, you're going to find them on the inside of a protein that will end up. So remember, T cells are trying to find their correct antigen, right? So it needs to be one that's endogenously expressed because it needs to be something that's found inside of a microbe generally in order to get that good hydrophobicity that's going to fit really nicely in that peptide binding curve. So remember, this is kind of a love story for me, right? MHC class 1 is presenting antigen to T cells. So I kind of think of this almost like an engagement ring, where MHC class 1 is the ring box, and the T cell is specific for a wide variety of antigens, but only one specific antigen is the right one. The ring box doesn't really care what it's holding. It could be holding something from a carnival, or it could be holding something from a jeweler's. And the ring could be anything. It could be a sapphire and emerald. It could be a five-carat diamond or a quarter-chip diamond. As long as it matches what the TCR needs, then the TCR will make a reaction. Okay, so let's talk function. The key to the function of either of the MHC molecules is knowing where they get their peptides from. The pathway that the MHC class 1 molecule uses is the endogenous pathway of antigen presentation. This literally refers to peptides that are produced within the cell. 
often by the host cell. They're often made by the host cell. So these would be things like viral peptides and proteins because viruses replicate within our cells, tumors, which obviously are our own cells that we maybe don't want anymore. But it could also include things like just proteins within your cell that are being degraded because it's time for them to be degraded. So it could even be something that's not made entirely correctly. So how does this work? Well, over here I've got an image of the MHC class 1 endogenous pathway, and I got this from eBioscience online, so if you want to read more about it, you can go there and find it. All right, so how does this work? All nucleated cells have these little machines called proteasomes. These are little tube-like structures that are shown here. Proteins, often misfolded proteins, are ubiquinated and directed into the proteasome by the enzyme ubiquitin. So you've got these intracellular antigens. They become ubiquinated, which basically signals them for their destruction. So they get signaled for destruction, and from that point, they are a dead peptide walking. So they walk right over to the proteasome, and the proteasome then chops them up and spits them out the other end as peptides. Consider it like a protein wood chipper, okay? And this kind of book sets up a protein recycling system because the cell is very efficient. So the peptides are then transported into the ER using a transporter system known as TAP, which literally stands for transporters of antigenic peptides. And it transports these peptides into the ER. Now, the ER is where all protein synthesis is done, right? So within the ER, we can reuse these peptides or we can present them, right? So the other thing that's happening here is that your MHC class 1 molecule is being made. So you get your alpha chain and your beta 2 microglobulin chain, and then within the alpha chain between alpha 1 and 2, where you have that peptide binding group, one of the peptides that was brought in via the TAP gets loaded into the peptide binding groove. And this whole process is facilitated by a protein known as tapasin. So tapasin actually binds to MHC class 1 and helps facilitate its basically association with the peptides that are produced from the proteasome and brought into the ER using TAP. So at this point, you have an MHC class 1 molecule that is made and loaded with a peptide. So now we need to start antigen presentation. So this whole complex then passes through the Golgi, and then inside a vesicle, it actually heads to the surface. So this is an exocytic vesicle that then heads to the surface and is expressed on the surface, basically holding the peptide up saying, is there any T cell here that recognizes this peptide? Now, there's a caveat to this. It isn't just viral peptides that are degraded by proteasomes and expressed on the surface as antigens. All proteins, including your own proteins, are constantly being digested by proteasomes and then expressed on the surface of MHC molecules. So why don't we make responses to them? Well, the T cells go through a little bit of an education during their development. So T cells coming along seeing a self-peptide are going to look at it and go, Seems okay with me, because they've been educated on what is self and what is not self, and told not to recognize self molecules and not to bind them. In fact, if they did recognize a self molecule with really high affinity, they would have been killed during their development. This process is called central tolerance, and we'll go into this in the depth as we create T cells later in this lesson. But this process is a good way of checking out what's going on in your cells. Using this endogenous pathway could alert your immune system to tumor cells so that your cells could react, saying like, wait a minute, even if this looks like a self-antigen, it's not. Or if it is, it's gone bad, and we need to get rid of it. And this is how we find it. These intracellular-derived peptides are recognized only by CD8 T cells. CD8 T cells specifically recognize antigens that are expressed in the context of MHC class 1. If it's an MHC class 1 molecule, it is going to be recognized by CD8 T cells. The TCR of the CD8 positive T cell that is selected needs to be able to recognize both the MHC molecule and the antigen.
if it only recognizes one, no reaction will happen. So if you show a peptide without MHC, T cell can't see it. If you show the MHC without the peptide, you still don't see it. So it needs both. And then when that happens, the TCR will then go through a conformational change that triggers through CD3, allowing for the T cell response. And this basically makes it so that the CD8 T cell can trigger a variety of molecules crossing into the intracellular membrane and basically killing the cell. Okay, now on to the MHC class II molecules. The MHC class II molecules are called the HLA-D molecules, and they are named HLA-DR, DP, and DQ. You can remember this, you guessed it, by remembering that the MHC class II molecules are named with two letters, DR, DP, DQ. The tissue distribution is very different from MHC class I molecules. Remember, MHC class I molecules are expressed on all cells, whereas MHC class II molecules are really only on professional antigen-presenting cells. So these are your monocyte macrophages, your dendritic cells, and your B cells, and that's about it. If it doesn't present antigen regularly, then it isn't expressing MHC class II. Okay, let's talk structure. Once again, we've got two chains, and both chains this time are going to traverse the cell membrane. Once again, the chains are named alpha and beta, except there's no microglobulin chain this time, and both chains are actually going to participate in the binding cleft. So as you can see here, your alpha-1 chain and your beta-1 domain, sorry, your alpha-1 domain and beta-1 domain are basically going to create your peptide binding cleft here that's going to allow for peptide expression or presentation to your T cell. They both have these domains that then are able to cross the cell membrane into your antigen presenting cell. And remember, these are professional antigen presenting cells. The peptide binding groove of the MHC class II molecule is a bit more open than the MHC class I molecule. Therefore, it can bind larger structures. And these can be as large as about 20 amino acids in length and are anywhere from 14 to 24 on average. The function of the MHC class II molecules is to provide antigen presentation specifically to CD4 positive T cells or your T helper cells in this case. Now it's going to present antigens that have been engulfed from the extracellular. So to get its antigens, it's going to use the exogenous pathway of antigen presentation. So in this case, think back to your immature dendritic cell that's at the site where our kid stepped on a rusty nail, okay? His immature dendritic cells gobble up pathogens, and then they go through this exogenous pathway to create an MHC class II molecule that contains antigens from that rusty nail to then be presented on the surface to CD4 positive T cells, which will help instruct the now mature dendritic cell how to kill that microbe that it's ingested. And once they travel to the site, they'll also instruct other um, phagocytic cells on how to kill pathogens that they've already ingested. So how does the exogenous pathway of antigen presentation work? So pathogens, particles, whatever, are engulfed from the outside and trapped into a vesicle, an endocytic vesicle or a lysosome or endosome, whatever you want to call it. This, remember, becomes that phagolysosome, right? Because you get um, basically fusion with peptides and chemicals and fragments that are capable of kind of digesting this microbe that the cell has engulfed from outside to break it down, okay? So you've got your phagosome that basically fuses with your lysosome and that leads to the degradation of the microbe potentially. But that's not enough. We need to know what we're dealing with so that we can amplify the response to the adaptive immune response. And that's where this um, antigen presentation comes in. So what exactly happens? In the ER, all the way down here, where all proteins are synthesized, MHC class II is also being synthesized. So you get expression of your alpha chain and your beta chain. Now, here's one problem. We don't want that binding cleft getting filled right now. We want it to stay open because we don't want endogenously expressed antigens getting into this binding cleft. So instead, we make this thing. 
It's called the invariant chain, okay? This invariant chain is basically temporarily inserted into the peptide binding cleft. Then the invariant chain plus the MHC class II molecule is basically put into a vesicle. Now that it's away from the ER where the other um, peptides that will go into the endogenous pathway are, we can actually degrade that invariant chain because there are no peptides in this vesicle that now could fill that cleft. So now we have our MHC class II molecule and its peptide binding cleft is empty, okay? So you have the MHC class II vesicle and you have your phagolysosome and the two meet and they join and there's fusion of them. But guess what? This phagolysosome is chock full of peptides that it degraded from our assaulting microbe. So now we take some of those peptides and we put them in the MHC class II molecule peptide binding groove. This vesicle is now transported to the surface where it can be expressed and bind to a CD4 positive T cell. So as you can see, both MHC class one molecules and MHC class two molecules are capable of binding a wide array of antigens. It's important to remember that the CD4 and CD8 molecules interact with both with the MHC class 1 or MHC class 2 molecule. And to keep this straight, I introduce you to the rule of 8. It's that all sides of your equation should equal 8. So MHC class 1 binds to, MA to CD8. MHC class 2 binds to CD4. 1 times 8 is, you guessed it, 8. 2 times 4 is 8. So if you're doing your math correctly, you always need to find for eight. So these are the main things you need to know about the two molecules. There's a table of this in your notes, but basically for MHC class one, you've got your HLA A, B, or C. It's expressed on all nucleated cells. It has an alpha chain that forms the binding cleft and a beta chain that provides stability. There's no invariant chain, but it does have this beta two microglobulin chain. And the point is for it to present peptides that are found or expressed endogenously within your cells. MHC class II molecules are your HLA-D molecules, DR, DP, DQ. They're only found on professional antigen presenting cells like your B cells, monocyte macrophages, and dendritic cells. They also have two chains, but in this case, both cross the membrane and both contribute to the peptide binding. The biological function of these is basically to present engulfed extracellular pathogens to CD4T helper cells. They don't have a beta-2 microglobulin chain. Instead, they have an invariant chain, which is temporarily placed in the peptide binding groove until the MHC class II molecule can fuse with peptides that are found in the phagolysosome.